I V M. It's the holidays. It's the end of the year, and how better to celebrate it than by talking about nuclear annihilation and the end of the world as we know it? Here on the Pragati Podcast, I'm a big fan of the Stanley Kubrick classic, Doctor Strange Love, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb. Maybe it can be a holiday movie for some of you. On the other hand, talking about nuclear war can actually be less depressing than what's happening across the country right now, with widespread, legitimate, peaceful protests against the Citizenship Amendment Act and the looming threat of a country-wide NRC. And in many places, these peaceful protests are being violently repressed by a policing system that is stuck in a different century. Don't forget to listen to episode 152 of The Seen and the Unseen, where Amit Verma talks to Srinath Raghavan about the CAA and the NRC. Nuclear war is absurd, but nuclear weapons have shaped geopolitical conflict for close to 75 years now. Here at home, terrorism out of Pakistan, cross-border firings on the line of control, surgical strikes all take place under the nuclear umbrella. Vipin Narang joins me on the Pragati podcast today to help us dive into the world of nuclear strategy and bust some myths along the way. Welcome to the Pragati Podcast, a weekly talk show on public policy, economics, and international relations. I'm your host, Pawan Shrinath. My guest today is Vipin Narang, associate professor of political science at MIT and a member of the security studies program there. He has authored the book Nuclear Strategy in the Modern Era and writes often for the popular press on nuclear and security matters. Dr. Narang has also been consistent in pointing out how India might have abandoned the no first use policy all but in name and many are coming around to this view in 2019. We'll start our conversation with Vipin Narang after a short break. Hey everybody, welcome to another awesome week on the IVM Podcast Network. If you're not following us on social media, please do. We're IVM Podcast at Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. I'd also like to thank our sponsors on the network this week, Intel, Storytel, and Cambly. Check them out, they're a really good bunch of brands. This week in the spirit of Christmas, instead of giving you the long drawn out promo that I normally do, all I'm going to do is ask you to give me a Christmas gift. Go to ivmpodcast.com slash survey, fill out our survey and send it out to us. We'd really appreciate it. And with that, let's get you back to your show. Hi, welcome to the Pragati Podcast. I'm Pavan Srinath and I'm here with Dr. Vipin Narang, who's visiting Bangalore uh, all the way from MIT. Dr. Narang, welcome to the Pragati Podcast. Thank you. Great to be here. Don't get to make it to Bangalore too often, but the traffic does live up to uh, advertisement. So, uh, oh, um, a, we are a... exceeding our reputation <laughs> these days on that count. <laughs> so I wanted to talk to you about the madness, the hilarity and the absurdity of um, nuclear strategy and nuclear warfare yeah why and how that sort of absurdity also defines the real world uh, in many ways and for most of us when we hear about nuclear strategy often still from movies and elsewhere we are taken back to the cold war era and sort of there's this idea of mutually assured destruction which is what sort of keeps this balance and keeps people from using nuclear weapons from that idea from the era of herman khan and others to today how should we really be thinking about nuclear strategy is there deterrence because otherwise there'll be the end of the world you know the way i describe it is nuclear deterrence theory and practice is like religion there are a lot of variants of it the fights are really violent but nobody really knows you know what the truth is because a thankfully we haven't had to test it but at the end of the day it's essentially theology right and so we have various theories of deterrence and what you described during the cold war uh, is kind of the conventional wisdom of, of how the U.S. and Soviet Union maintained uh, an unstable peace, um, as uh, it has sometimes been called. But mutually assured destruction was only for a fleeting moment actually U.S. policy. Okay. I think the um, the thing that we are now, I think, discovering as academics, but practitioners always knew, especially in the U.S. system, is that mutually assured destruction means you have to accept vulnerability to your adversary. Right. And there's something about the U.S. for a variety of reasons, strategic, ideological, domestic, political. The U.S. just doesn't like accepting vulnerability. And the Cold War actually, I think, for me, is better described as not a, a condition of mutual, a mutually assured destruction, but I would define it as a U.S. attempt to escape that. Okay. And uh, for a long time, the U.S. pursued damage limitation strategies, counterforce, uh, 
the idea of nuclear superiority and winning a nuclear war where, you know, Dr. Strangelove, you have this great line um, about, you know, Mr. President, I'm not saying you won't get your hair must, but there's, you know, two distinct but tragic outcomes, 10 million American dead versus 100 million American dead. And these are absurd numbers. But during the Cold War, the idea that you might be able to save 90 million Americans, if you have a, if you go first with everything, Mr. President, you may not get everything, but you're going to save 90 million Americans. That was a real temptation for the military, and they thought they could sell it to a president. And all of the capabilities that the U.S. developed early in the Cold War, I think there's an over, oversimplification, but there are probably two versions of American strategy during right. the Cold War. The first was, you know, obliterate everything and call it counterforce. Okay. Uh, for legal and moral reasons, uh, the United States legally, dis, you know, it, it, targeting civilians in a conflict violates the laws of armed conflict, right? And armed, uh, laws of armed conflict and warfare. And so countervalue nuclear targeting, holding cities at risk, was determined to actually be illegal. You couldn't intentionally target cities and civilian populations. Okay. And so the U.S. said, okay, legally, if we're going to, you know, nuclear targeting has to be counterforce. We can only target the military and maybe the industrial potential of the adversary. But we didn't have the accuracy and the numbers to do that. Okay. So... You would target a base but know that you'd blow up a lot of, you know, civilian population centers as a result. Uh, and so early counterforce is basically countervalue targeting, but we called it counterforce. It would essentially obliterate everything. And, and is that how the idea of second strike capability and all of that evolved from sort of this yeah, focus on taking out the enemies? The idea is second, you know, so second strike capability was, you know, very early on, theorists realized that you needed to have a sufficient capability to survive your adversary's first strike because you're always worried about the other side going first. But that never meant that the U.S. or the Soviet Union wanted to go second. There's always this incentive to go first. Military planners like going first. And the idea as a democratic nation that you would sit back and accept a nuclear hit from another country and lose citizens or armed forces before responding, especially if you knew that it was about to come, there was a real question about whether that is sustainable as a democracy, right. whether it violates democratic theory. And that has real implications in India today, for example, right? This whole concept of no first use. Right. Uh, if you really believe it, it means you have to sit back and accept a nuclear hit on potentially citizens before responding. Uh, so all this seems to mean that while we're talking about deterrence, there is always this extreme drive to to win, to win, no, to be right. the first to strike. That's right. So how do you achieve? While that might be politically salient, how do you achieve uh, sort of conflict stability of any sort if both of you want to be the first to sort of hit? Well, it's a real question side. whether there was conflict stability during the Cold War. I mean, there were there were proxy conflicts: right. Vietnam, Cuba, Berlin. And there was a very real competition between the U.S. and Soviet Union. And it didn't go hot between the two directly. But to bring this full circle, I think, you know, a lot of that was because the U.S. and Soviet Union were so terrified of a world-ending nuclear exchange that they were inhibited. I think at, at some level, even though the U.S. tried to escape mutually assured destruction, the sheer number of nuclear weapons the Soviet Union had made it almost impossible for the U.S. to really escape it. And there's this great line in Bob Jervis's uh, illogic of nuclear strategy, or maybe it was the meaning of the nuclear revolution. MAD is not a policy, it's a fact. Okay. And given the sheer numbers that the Soviet Union had, even if the U.S. could convince itself to get 99% of the Soviet arsenal, that still left 300 strategic nuclear weapons that would destroy the U.S. and then some. Uh, and so with those numbers, escaping MAD just became you know, virtually impossible. But the U.S. didn't stop trying. I think in the later half of the Cold War, uh, from the Nixon Ford after the Cuban Missile Crisis, you know Kennedy, I think, had this moment where they were like, "Okay, this is crazy." Uh, but then Nixon comes in office after Johnson and starts essentially what laid the groundwork for the new era of counterforce. You guys had Daryl Press and Kier Lieber here recently, right? right? And you know all the technologies they identify were basically started the accuracy revolution, the sensor revolution, damage limitation, then missile defenses, which are a big part of this, were started. You know, essentially the Nixon. Uh, era, but really picked up in the Carter administration. Carter may be the unsung hero for the counterforce cowboys because okay. the... Doesn't fit with the image of Carter. It doesn't. And it's interesting because two future secretaries of defense laid the groundwork for a lot of this technologies, okay. Bill Perry and Ash Carter. Uh, and they're in the Defense Department during the Carter administration. And they invested a lot in these technologies, largely for conventional capabilities. 
But at some point, the, the officials in the Reagan administration realized that you know putting these in your nuclear systems gave you very accurate hard target kill capability in your nuclear forces. Uh, and if you married it with the sensors uh, and the intelligence and surveillance and reconnaissance and then missile defenses, you could kind of get this symphony of what everyone dreamed was a, a more – you know, essentially sterile counterforce where you would actually physically target the nuclear capabilities of your adversary. You probably still couldn't do it against the Soviet Union. You probably can't do it against Russia. But, you know, I think you might be able to, you know, convince STRATCOM and some people in Washington that if push came to shove with China, you might be able to do it. With North Korea, you could probably, you know, if you got missile defenses to pick up residuals, if you went first, even if you missed a couple, and you could convince yourself that our missile defenses work, which they don't, uh, but one day they might. You can tell yourself a story that if push right. comes to shove, you know, damage limitation, Mr. President. It's not about. It's not that you're losing two million Americans. You're saving ten. And, okay. Uh, that basic seductive story has driven U.S. policy on a lot of this, and a lot the some of the worst temptations or habits of the U.S. are starting to find their way to other countries now too. And the idea that you have to accept vulnerability and that you have to accept. The stability and stability paradox, right? Proxy wars that were there during the Cold War right. for India now is terrorism on the homeland. And at some point you sit back and ask, how much of this can I take before I say, you know, enough is enough? And this, you know, idea of mutually assured destruction is is unsustainable, especially for democracies. I think the idea that you would accept attacks on your homeland, you know, and be neutralized by your adversary's nuclear capabilities is is not attractive to policymakers. And so we're seeing some of these dynamics replay themselves at the regional level now, too. So when it comes to sort of global nuclear powers, I mean, we had the P5 and you had notionally five nuclear powers, but it was still sort of two-sided, right? It was the U.S.-NATO and sort of the so other maybe side. I would say three-sided. You had, you had the NATO nuclear forces, which were uh, U.K. and the U.S. are basically a joint force. Right. Uh, apologies to my British friends, but the U. S. the U.K. nuclear force is effectively an adjunct force of the U.S. The only thing the British nuclear force is the fissile material. Okay. But it's a common missile pool with the U.S. In fact, um, it's widely known, but uh, I think it's not generally appreciated that British SSBNs load their missiles from the common pool in Georgia. Okay. Uh, and then, and then they, ship they them sail over. to Scotland, and then the British Holbrook warheads are mated with the trident missile but the trident is it's a common missile pool to be, so that's a joint force the french have been independent so you had the the nato block the soviet union on its own and then china was a third force and right. china's nuclear force actually allowed it to establish independence from the soviet union that was one of the uh primary drivers of uh the chinese nuclear uh the nuclear weapons program in addition to the potential coercive threat from the U.S. Right. So China's was a third way, essentially. And so you had three, you basically have three nuclear blocks in the P-5. But now we're getting to a point where half of the nuclear weapons powers in the world are not members of the NPT. Right. right? Well, we probably have about a dozen now declared or undeclared. Well, we're at power. nine and then uh, ten. So Israel, India, Pakistan never signed the NPT. North Korea withdrew from the NPT after cheating. So that's four. And then South Africa is the fifth, and it had never signed the NPT. So five of the ten nuclear weapons powers that have existed empirically have not been members of the NPT. And we don't know about Saudi Arabia and Iran and... and yeah, I mean, I think... And Israel. By, and by, I mean, Israel is widely acknowledged to be a nuclear weapons power. I think the, the by definition, the problem for the NPT is going to be that all future nuclear weapons powers will have been NPT members in good standing if they ever require. So they'll either have to withdraw or they'll have to cheat. Okay. And the NPT can withstand one North Korea. Can it withstand Iran, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, South Korea, Japan? I think we start reaching a point where if you start getting more cheaters and withdrawers, the NPT becomes very difficult to sustain. Uh, and that's a concern. And we're already at 50 percent essentially of – states outside of the NPT or non-nuclear weapon states that have acquired nuclear weapons. And, uh, you know, this is – there's a long history here in India of uh, reacting to what I think just once thing famously called nuclear apartheid. Right. Um, but it is going to be very difficult to sustain the institution of the NPT, I think, or it'll have to be recrafted in a way that accounts for new proliferators down the road. But what does it mean for – I mean, if we look at this from a game theory angle or something else, when you have – 
10 or 12 nuclear powers in the world we don't know, with yeah. different equations. Yeah. Uh, I mean, w- one of the things I wanted to ask is a lot of game theory did develop during the early periods of the nuclear... Yeah, where it's a two-player game. Quantum. And game theory is great for two-player games. Right. But as soon as you have multiplayer games, it becomes very, very difficult. Uh, and but has there been a parallel academic evolution looking at sort of nuclear strategy and deterrence since the time of shelling no, to now? I mean, multipolar nuclear deterrence is kind of this new area. And the, the academy, I mean, game theory isn't well suited for the, that kind of competition. And, you know, deterrence theory, this is kind of my, you know, it's very easy to to have a rationalist account of deterrence theory based on shelling and, right. you know, game theory and cost-benefit analysis. And if I hold it, risk this much popular. I mean, there have been various formulations in practice, right? So the right. U.S. and the Soviet Union basically held each other completely at risk. The French had a very interesting strategy called proportional deterrence, uh, or you could call it proportional. They basically wanted to be able to hold at risk as much of the Soviet Union as France was worth. So okay. that much industrial economic population – you know, I don't know what the population of France is. Call it 60 million people, right? right? So France decided it only needed to hold at risk the equivalent of France in the Soviet Union to dissuade for, to the Soviet Union from attacking France. And that's a very interesting deterrence calculation. Uh, but I think what we don't appreciate a- enough – so we have these sterile academic theories. And, right. you know, my book is a, essentially a sterile academic book on these different strategies that are easily observable. That makes it easy to do the analysis, right? Because you say, if I'm a rational decision, if I'm a rational state, this is how I behave. But deterrence is really a psychological game, right? And this is where the U.S. attempt to escape MAD ran into the psychological problem that the the idea that another state is holding at risk your cities, your population – no matter how much damage limitation capability you have, no matter how good your counterforce is, decision makers are – are always going to be dissuaded. You know, this is the counter argument that the theorists, the so-called theorists of the nuclear revolution, the Bob Jervises, the Bernard Brodies, uh, you know, w- would argue. They say when it, when push comes to shove, you know, no, no stakes are worth potentially losing a city. And this is kind of China's argument, North Korea's argument too. North Korea doesn't have a survivable arsenal against the United States. It's a plausibly survivable arsenal, even if it's lowly. The 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 game that Kim Jong Un is playing is essentially: Are you willing to risk a, even a ten percent chance that you lose Los Angeles? And he's betting that no American president would. Right. You know, so, absent, so in yeah. that sense, it's almost about looking at saying there is this very low threshold of unacceptable damage that that sort of every nuclear power right. almost has. I'm not willing to lose even I don't know half a million citizens. Right. 100,000 citizens. I mean, these are absurd number. numbers if you think about they it. Right? Are, I mean, they are. We haven't lost... I mean, the, the, the casualties on the Eastern Front of World War II, the, the Soviet losses right. uh, to the Nazis and vice versa, th- that was catastrophic. I mean, those are the numbers we're talking about. Right. And it was a catastrophe for these countries, right? And, you know, we throw these numbers out there and strange love you throw out, you know, 10 million versus 100 million. But when you sit and think about what this means for a state going forward and its ability to – what does it mean to survive when you've lost a third of your population, right? I mean – I mean when, say, Pulwama or something else is considered unacceptable. Right. I and mean, thankfully that doesn't you know, immediately result in a nuclear weapon being thrown overboard. But the idea yeah. is that if you know, less than 100 lives – of even your fighting forces, not just civilians, is worth a lot. Yeah, then and how much do you value and, the losses? And, you know, nuclear states in that particular case, I think both India and Pakistan, I think would rationally say it's not worth risking a nuclear exchange over Pulwama, as horrible as it was. Right. Because you're talking about, you know, losing another... 10 million people in a potential strategic nuclear exchange, not to mention right. the environmental effects. And I think the concern from the outside, and I say this as an outsider, and I have the luxury of sitting in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and so I know there's a lot of you know, criticism when outsiders comment on this, but I, I think that the the lessons that both India and Pakistan took away from Balakot was that they could get their punch in without escalation. Right. And the the concern I have is that these are stochastic processes, right? And so if you re-ran Balakot 10 times, how many times do you get this the outcome you got? Right. And I would venture to say it's probably less than a majority. 
So if you roll the dice, maybe 30% of the time you got, you know, no escalation. But what if Abhi Nandan had died when he got hit right. by the F-16? What if he had died in Pakistani custody? What if Prime Minister Modi had launched the dozen BrahMos surface-to-surface missile across the international border? The Ari Hunt was out to sea. Whether it had weapons on board, nobody knows. But, you know, what if there had been an accident and uh-huh. India thought that Pakistan was responsible for it? I see more pathways to escalation, not necessarily nuclear escalation, but escalation to the point where if you've got ground forces involved, armies get scared, right? This is where the psychological right. component of it comes in. And so the notion that escalation was easy, it was good, it was easy to control, I think is, for me, the wrong lesson. When I look at crises like what the U.S. has with North Korea, you know, running up the B-1s up to the NLL and then, you know, pulling back, right. to me, that's crazy. Right. And similarly, I think in Balako, the idea that you could do this over again or raise the ante and, you know, push another nuclear state. I mean, we have never seen a nuclear state use air power directly on the, the sovereign territory of another nuclear power before. Right. And yes, that showed resolve, but it does run risks of escalation. And that was inhibited in the past. And I think one of the new dimensions of this new nuclear age is that states are dissatisfied with being constrained. And we're seeing states pushing the lines with other nuclear states in ways that we haven't seen before. Turkey, which hosts U.S. nuclear weapons, was shooting at U.S. nuclear forces in Syria. Think about how absurd and crazy that is. The U.S. stores 50 nuclear weapons at Incherlik Air Base on Turkey, and you had tur- controlled by uh, the Turkish Air Force, and the Turkish Army is shooting at the, at the U.S. across the border. We've never been in a situation like that. And in this year, we have more firsts that between two nuclear powers than I'd like to see in a given year, let alone in a decade. <laughs> so, so in that sense, do individual incidents like this, like like Balakot, like Pulwama, like uh, what happened um, earlier, do they give a false sense of security for some practitioners, perhaps sort of reading into one or two data points instead of looking at, say, what if you run this? Look at the distribution. Times? Exactly. Exactly. Because- I, I think that's right. And I think, you know, there's always been this notion that nuclear states need to have their Cuban Missile Crisis moment to really understand psychologically the mad uh, phenomena effect at a psychological level, even if right. the numbers don't line up, et cetera. Right. But here's the problem. If you don't think you've faced a Cuban Missile Crisis moment, if you don't think Balakot and Cargill and Mumbai and Parakram were tense crises that rival the Cuban Missile Crisis, then you're not going to think it's... Right. It's not going to be a chastening moment, right? For both sides, right? The And Pakistan certainly shouldn't get a free pass. These guys are using their nuclear weapons as a shield behind which to aggress, and they think it's working. And they are the ones running risks by poking India in urban and metropolitan centers. Like, what nuclear state can accept a Mumbai even once a decade? That's ridiculous, right? So, you know, Pakistan has, has also decided to try to see how far it can go. Uh, and so... Mumbai itself was a case of we never seen Pakistan sort of going and sort of it having sort of outcomes much bigger than what they had sort of even aimed for, perhaps. Right? I mean, Maybe. I mean, I, and this is the thing, right? There's a you may intend Pakistan may intend this size attack, but if it's if that's successful, they say, oh, let's go bigger, right? And you can't control escalation at any right. level, subconventional, conventional, nuclear. And when we talk about red lines. Like that's a very rationalist view of things. These are pink lines. They blur, right? right? And you can very quickly find yourself... Uh, here's the other thing about red lines. This, both sides have to agree where they are, right? I may think your red line is here. You may think it's there. And if you operate in the middle, that's when you get real escalation risks in between the perception of where the red lines lie between the two states. So, you know, the this idea... I'd look at, at Mumbai 2008. The equivalent in the U.S. would be you know, if uh, Al Qaeda or ISIS had stormed New York City and killed 173 people, what do you think the U.S. would have done? The U.S. would have ended a state. I don't think that would be 9/11 round two. Yeah, I mean, worse. I think actually, like you know, if you if you hit soft targets and you know, it'll, yeah, 9/11 round two. I think that's probably what it would be. And we ended two states. Right. You know, after that, right? We invaded two countries after 9/11. And you know, the for a state to sit back. I understand the Indian predicament. I mean, I think there's also like a, you know, nobody is giving Pakistan a free pass on this. And the the source ultimately lies, that's the provocation. The question is whether, if Pakistan's not going to change its behavior, 
and you can't get it to change its behavior and the U.S. can't get Pakistan to change its behavior, then what is the the best response for India's long-term strategic benefit, right? In I think the U.S. academic community, most analysts have settled on the biggest threat to a nation's security is overreaction. The U.S. started two wars after 9-11, but overstretched itself. And now look at what's happening. The U.S. is retrenching. And we didn't win the war in Afghanistan. Iraq is going to be a mess for a long time. And, you know, you ask yourself if the U.S. had, you know, only done Afghanistan and not Iraq. Had, did overreach begin the – was that the beginning of the end for the U.S., right? And But to even agree that wherever we are now is an end for the U.S. will be contested deeply by uh, – Not an end to the U.S., but I mean I think there's certainly – you know, the, the Donald Trump phenomena is is a symptom. It's not a right. – the cause is something very deeper in the U.S. and this war wariness. And you know, I think this idea of retrenchment – is very domestically, politically powerful and salient in the U.S. right now. The whole concept of make America great again is a very nativist ideology. It's anti-immigration. Right. It's also keeping American forces back home and not overreaching and starting what I think many Americans believed were unnecessary wars. And after Afghanistan, Afghanistan is not a, a – I mean that's a – there's a reasonable argument to be made that you had to go in Afghanistan and get rid of al-Qaeda, and we did that. But the aims in Afghanistan were right. more than that, right? It was about transforming Afghanistan to Switzerland, and that's just not something any foreign power is really capable of doing. But if you had a very narrow goal in Afghanistan, right. which was eliminate al-Qaeda, you could have done that, and we could have been home much earlier. But you know, this idea that you know the that the U.S. domestic public is is war where is real and i i think something the rest of the world is now starting to consider is the biggest impact of donald trump does win re-election mm -hmm. is that that's when i think this project of retrenchment in, from global affairs will really take hold and Tight. eight years is a long time and i think a lot of the world a lot of american allies have given the u.s four years said okay donald trump let's see if it's an aberration if it's an aberration right. then you know we can get we can you know, things will realign. Realign, and there's there's only so much damage you can do in four years as a theory. Although I would contest, I think we've done a lot of damage. Um, but for for the Trump administration, this isn't damage. This is the end, right? Right. You know, for a long time, burden sharing with our allies has been a big concern, but it's always been been done quietly. Uh, now, out in the open, is shaking down South Korea for five billion dollars, right? Which is five right. times the the cost, and it's such an absurd request that it's basically designed to get South Korea to say no, so that. You know, it will justify a U.S. withdrawal. Yeah, withdrawal or drawdown. I'm not sure. You know, we'll get to a complete withdrawal. I think the Pentagon would have very strong objections to that. And I think that coming full circle, it it's not surprising then that like the you might start seeing erstwhile U.S. allies start thinking about nuclear weapons. Right. Um, Japan is a virtual nuclear state, right? Japan has everything they need for nuclear weapons. Uh, I used to joke a Sony PlayStation has greater processing power than most early U.S. nuclear weapons, right? And Japan has reprocessed plutonium. South Korea is further away, but you know there's there's already you know quiet discussion among the conservatives. Public opinion and support for nuclear weapons in South Korea has always been very high and stable at about sixty-five to seventy percent. Right. Depends on how I ask the question, but you know nevertheless there, there's support for it. So it wouldn't be the public stopping the government if they wanted to do it. And we're starting to see Germany starting to float the idea of a, a shared you know, European nuclear deterrent if the U.S. withdraws. Right. Um, I'm not sure what that would look like. I don't see the French extending their deterrent. But you know, Germany has always flirted with the idea of an independent arsenal, uh, mostly to get greater reassurance from the U.S. But at some point, you know, that might become a, uh, and a real temptation. And increasingly we're seeing this, right? I mean, even Iran had signed this nuclear deal. And yeah. then while Iran might have been doing all kinds of other things, there was no overt excessive sort of nuclear development oh, it was a, that it was I, every, they actually followed the, everything absolutely the IAEA the US intelligence community the US military all agreed that Iran was abiding by its JCPOA commitments and, so you see model abidement of commitments and then, and then violated, revocation yep. and then you see what's happening in North Korea and then they still have some nuclear weapons so therefore they're being given a seat on a negotiation table that oh, was yeah, my, never extended before. If I'm Iran and I see Kim Jong-un getting the red carpet of Singapore and Hanoi and love letters from Trump and you know Iran is getting hate tweets right. 
you think it's good to be a nuclear weapons power. Exactly. Right. And and you will see, and like you said, the same uh, sort of motivation, a similar motivation can be in Japan and South Korea and such places right. as well, which are not necessarily considered I, I mean, enemy I, states, but allies who are sort of left hanging. No, and allies, you know, the one of the greatest... Um, non-proliferation tools that the U.S. has had is extended deterrence. We kept right. our allies non-nuclear by extending our deterrent. And I think, look, we've had these issues with allies before. I think the Eisenhower administration floated proposals to withdraw the American footprint in, in Europe. I mean, Eisenhower commanded NATO for... I mean, he, the idea that U.S. force would be permanently stationed in Europe was something that those administ- early administrations never thought would be possible. Right. But Europe freaked out so much that he had to double down. And so... You know, it's not like we haven't been here before, but we haven't been here for a long time, right? And periodically, allies worry about extended deterrence and reassurance, but not at this level. I mean, there are always concerns about certain capability. Are we withdrawing too much? You know, Japan is worried about the retirement of certain capabilities, but those are on the margins. This is a fundamental threat to the integrity of our alliances. Uh, and, and the other thing we've seen here is that I mean, for better or worse, a country like India getting nuclear weapons also suddenly puts it on a different table in the world stage. You want to have different types of negotiations. So if more and more countries, which are sort of increasing in prosperity and income and so on, think that getting a nuclear weapon at the right stage of their development will be a way of signaling their competence. Exactly. Right. I mean, and if you see that happening in Africa two decades from now. We don't know what the world might really look like. Yeah, and like. I mean, there's at some point you start getting, you know, domino effects. Right. Um, and there's an academic debate as to whether that's a real thing. But I see the way I look at the nuclear, you know, kind of the the evolution of the nuclear landscape, it's one big domino, right? You've got U.S. begat the Soviets, which begat the French and the U.K., although those are a little different, which begat the Chinese, which begat India, Pakistan, because of not the Indian bomb, but 70, 71. And, but once India started flirting with the bomb, Pakistan had to double down. Uh, Israel begat Iraq, Syria, Iran. The Israeli preemptive policy of no reactors in the region worked for a while. But then, you know, AQ Khan right. started selling enrichment technology and it became much harder for the Israelis to destroy enrichment facilities, uh, especially hardened ones. These states have learned. And so... Uh, Libya also, right? And so if, if Iran goes, though, then Israel begat Iran, which then begat Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and the Gulf. And, you know, if Iran gets a nuclear weapon, you could have a real cascade in the Middle East. And, you know, when we talk about going back to game theory, there's a there are very, very stringent assumptions about the a unitary rational actor. And it's not like right. these states aren't rational, but the unitariness of it is questionable, right? Because it is unclear sometimes who's making decisions. And there's, uh, when you talk about multipolar nuclear landscapes, you have a lot of different interests and incentives and constituencies in these countries. uh, And they may not be as stable domestically, right? right, As And every nuclear power has had to evolve its institutions over time, right? I mean, when the nuclear bomb was sort of developed, people in the army, sort of the first idea was that it's a really big bomb. Whereas a nuclear bomb is something else. It's yeah. not a big bomb anymore. Right. It is a different beast altogether. Right. 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 So sort of the evolution of what this thing is, what how do you think about it? What's the narrative you house this weapon in? Right. That needs to evolve within your sort of government, within your uh, government institutions. And then you have to develop norms and strategies around that. Yeah. Right? yeah. I mean, there's the hardware piece of it. And then oftentimes the software piece comes much later. Right. Right. And. I think you, it's fair to say India, Pakistan, 20 years later, are still developing the software. Right. I mean, the U.S. is still developing the software. You know, but there was, I think, uh, the biggest change over the last 10 years. I mean, we forget April 2009 was Obama's prox speech. And where have we come in a decade, basically, right? Th- that was an effort to reduce the salience of nuclear weapons in American foreign policy and hopefully thereby global Right. Nuclear policy, right? You had – INF Treaty was, you know, fully intact at that point. The Russians weren't yet violating. You had New START. And, you know, the U.S. had a modernization program, but the idea was to reduce the salience and the role of U.S. nuclear weapons in our grand strategy. And here we are where it's very difficult to tell states that nuclear weapons aren't useful, right? The U.S. is full board modernization. Uh, Some states rely on nuclear weapons for their day-to-day security. Pakistan, Russia, whose uh, conventional forces are in disrepair, you know, North Korea – they rely on nuclear weapons for their day-to-day security, and there's this prestige element, and there's this domestic political boost. So 
it's very hard to, to argue that states shouldn't get nuclear weapons when they see nuclear weapon states getting all these benefits from it. And so we're, we're, we're back in a phase where I think states may see the utility of nuclear weapons as net positive. Right. And again, stochastically, then you'll start seeing more nuclear weapons programs. And Because, I mean, during the Cold War era, there were whispers of nuclear programs in states like Malaysia and others, which would be unthinkable yeah. today, right? But, yeah. but the idea that something like that might be possible 20 years from now is... I mean, uh, entirely open. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I'm still an optimist in the sense that the um, there are these are hard programs to develop and manage. Uh, they are very costly for states. States can make themselves vulnerable if they start pursuing nuclear weapons, right? So Burma, right? There's always this mysterious what is Burma, this nuclear reactor in Burma thing, and a state that isn't on the radar suddenly gets on the radar. Right. So either you have to present a fait accompli, like North Korea. Or you have to have a protector like North Korea. Actually, North Korea had you know for had Soviet and then Chinese protection until right. there wasn't. And part of the North Korean bomb actually is to gain independence from China, I believe. Uh, but you know, states like Libya, you know, getting caught with a nuclear weapons program essentially, you know, there it could have been the end of Gaddafi. Right. And well, but there was an end of Gaddafi. Ultimately, it was the end of because Gaddafi. he did not have the bomb, right? Yeah, so, so that's, that's the argument that other states yeah. can make. In fact, Gaddafi giving, didn't have giving it. up the give, giving up the technology itself was the biggest mistake. You know, other states. So when when the U.S. says, you know, the Libya model for North Korea, which refers to picking up these centrifuges and moving them to Oak Ridge, Tennessee, you know. They that's what when John Bolton referred to it, he likes to say that's what he referred to. But Kim Jong Un here is yeah, and ten years later Gaddafi was killed on the streets of you exactly. know, Tripoli. So you know, the Libya model isn't comforting to uh it's the exact thing business. a proliferator would, would want to point to exactly. saying this gives me sort of personal security as well yep. for a for a dictator or you know, um, someone who's not even democratically elected. Right. Um, along with this, I just wanted to try and say maybe bust some myths that exist sort of in the general public about nuclear weapons. Sure. One that I've seen surfaces once in a while is to say that, look, because you have nuclear weapons, you can actually moderate on defense expenditure because you have nuclear nukes. You don't need these immense standing armies with conventional right. warfare. Has that even been remotely true in the last 60, 70 years? No, nah, I don't think so. So, I mean, in theory, there should be this nuclear conventional trade-off. Right. Uh, but again, it comes down to what are you asking your nuclear forces to do for you, right? So there are two things, right? If a state acquires nuclear weapons to deter a conventional attack, it still wants a very strong conventional option capability right. because it doesn't want to go nuclear necessarily, right? Right. Uh, because that would be potentially suicidal. The second piece of this is even if you're not using nuclear weapons to offset uh, conventional attack, you still have very powerful military bureaucracies that want a lot of nice new toys. And it's very hard to say no to those bureaucracies. And especially with, if you have three services, all three services want nice new toys. And so empirically, you know, I I haven't looked at it closely, but anecdotally, I think it's very difficult to sustain the argument that it's a cost-saving measure on conventional forces. In fact, because of the so-called stability and stability paradox, if one believes that, you may find yourself in more conventional kind of conflicts, or you may have to prepare for different kinds of conventional conflicts. In fact, you know, on the conventional side, nuclearization of the subcontinent has forced India to think about short, precise conventional engagements, which okay. is not what it was equipped for. It was equipped for attrition warfare. The strike corps are built for one thing, one thing only, and that's to break Pakistan. Right. But you can't break Pakistan when it has nuclear weapons. So you now have to modernize your force for something, call it proactive strategy, or call it whatever on the ground. And for the Indian Air Force, it's standoff capability, which it was not designed for either. And so you may actually have to spend more to develop the capability to change the kind of conventional warfare you have to fight under the shadow of nuclear weapons. Uh, in some ways, I think it's probably been more expensive for India. And, and the other, which I think perhaps people don't link strongly enough and I want your views on this is, which is that it is nuclear weapons that have enabled perhaps more subconventional warfare and terrorism yeah, and other a big things debate to... about that I mean I see more there was a very heavily baked in assumption in the theory of the nuclear revolution and, the, and MAD that you wouldn't have a, a revisionist state right a provocateur and the states that are emboldened 
you know, to use our nuclear weapons as a shield behind which to aggress. And Pakistan then provided this model. Paul Kapoor wrote this book, Dangerous Deterrent. One of my former students, Mark Bell, who's at the University of Minnesota, has uh, an, an article in International Security called Beyond Emboldenment that talks about different foreign policy behaviors, not just war, but more aggressive foreign policy. Right. Uh, and you can say, look, in the North Korean case, North Korea was actually aggressive before it had nuclear weapons, but it can be aggressive in different ways now. Right. Uh, and it can really push the line. And the Pakistan-North Korea model, you know, I think Israel and Saudi Arabia and the U.S. worry about Iran doing the same thing, you know, providing a shield for Hezbollah. It may not work the same as with Pakistan and LET and Jashi Mohammed, but, you know, this idea that states get nuclear weapons and all of a sudden your security satisfied is clearly not empirically 100 percent true. And, you know, so... This changes the idea of nuclear stability. This is a very ugly stability, right? The idea in you know in the Indian case that you have to accept terrorist attacks from your nuclear neighbor. That's on its face. That's it, it, it's absurd to say that you have to do that. Right. So you know the Pakistan really did change the model when it came to this. I mean, it's not like the Soviet Union wasn't revisionist and the U.S. wasn't revisionist in in, in various places like in Berlin or Vietnam, and but it wasn't direct. Right now, you're seeing revisions in the homeland of right. the other state, and that really changes things. Right, right, and and finally, this idea that you know no first use is a good strategy for the likes of India. Now, I mean, you might expand on this in a different podcast episode, yeah, no, no. but but uh, I mean, you've written extensively on this. I don't want to get in trouble. This. Yeah, I no, mean, but but people I think disagreed with you more vehemently a few years ago, and I think people are coming around now. Right. I mean, I'd like to say that I was always right, and uh, <laughs> but you know, there's. Part of this comes back to – so there's also – I think there's been a misunderstanding about my analytical views, my analysis versus my normative views. Right. Interestingly enough, people forget that in my book, I'm very you know, supportive of India's strategy of assured retaliation right. in the sense that India's security environment and what it asks of its nuclear forces is actually kind of optimized for assured retaliation, right? Because the conventional forces are strong enough – to defeat Pakistan, and you, you don't need uh, nuclear weapons to deter Chinese conventional attack because right. of the terrain advantages. And also, I think the local force balances are actually, are pretty symmetrical or can be symmetrical with China. So re- all you're really asking of your nuclear forces are to deter nuclear attack and coercion from your two primary adversaries. So therefore, you can have a uh, declared no first use policy, which can be made credible by the way you steward your forces. Um, but I think there's always been a discomfort in India with the idea of no first use, an absolute no first use policy because of this issue of preemption, this issue of if you knew that especially Pakistan were going to use nuclear weapons, could you really sit back and let them do it? And in this particular, it's not that India would go first out of the blue. It is if you knew that Pakistan had no choice and was about and was oper- and you detected that they were moving nuclear weapons, would right. you sit back and try to preempt them or would you actually accept a hit on your citizens or your forces with a nuclear weapon, wait to see what it was and then retaliate? I think no democratic leader can actually be okay with that, right? It's almost – in a lot of ways, no first use is anti-democratic if you're a democratic state, right? Because it's – you're asking yourself to put citizens on a platter and sacrifice them. You're, you're right? sort of saying that you don't have monopoly over violence till the first strike, yeah, right? Yeah, and, I mean, is... and Vajpayee was the first to say – first, I actually go back to the draft nuclear doctrine. In the 99 draft nuclear doctrine – the language is very um, interesting. It said uh, – the, the language was India will not be the first to initiate a nuclear strike, okay. which meant that if you detected the other side initiating the process, it would relieve the strictures of no first use. 2000, Vajpayee sits I think in Jalandhar or Amarjan, in Punjab somewhere, my peeps. And he's, he said, you know, they say they're going to use a nuclear weapon. Do they, do they know what it means? If you think we'll sit back and let them do it before we act, you have another thing coming. And then you had – uh, you know, Shiv Shankar Menon's 2010 uh, NSA speech. You had uh, Parikar, Shiv Shankar Menon's book, General Nagel at the SFC. And then for me, the death knell was really um, Rajnath Singh at Pokhran right. this year. I mean, I accepted the debates about, you know, this is ambiguity being injected, but it's not official capacity, this, that, the other. Parikar walked it back, but he's a sitting defense minister. And I had always suspected that this expressed a strand of real discomfort with an absolute NFU. Forget the doctrine. The doctrine itself doesn't actually have an absolute no first use policy, by the way, because there's a chem bio exception, which means, you know, if you're hit by a chem bio, you'll still retaliate with nuclear weapons versus first use of nuclear weapons. But this issue of preemption, I think, has always seized the Indian national security elite. uh, And the strand kept emerging in ways that I think 
for Chris Clary, my co-author in this in the latest article, you know, for us it was too consistent and over a very specific issue for it to just be random musings. I think, even right. though I think the random musings worked for India because it injected ambiguity, but they could they could have, they wanted to have it both ways, which was. We want to have to declare no first use, but we want to inject enough ambiguity to deter Pakistan and China, just enough, right? right? So have both out there. So, so you want sort of the moral high ground that comes from no first use. You want your cake and you want to be able to eat it too. You want the deterrent effect, but you want the the moral exactly. You know, the moral high ground of being able to say that we have a no first use policy and we're responsible to stake. Well, I, look, I get it. I just, you know, the problem is as soon as you inject ambiguity, it's not a real no first use anymore. And then, you know, when Rajat Singh at Pokhran, as the sitting defense minister, in a carefully scripted speech, basically says, you know, we've had it up until now, but what happens depends on you know, future circumstances. That, by definition, cuts the knees off of no first use. No first use is, is, a set, is actually a pledge about what you will not do in the future. Right. So if you say it depends on circumstances, <laughs> you've just cut it off at the knees. And, you know, the, the U.S. does not have a no first use policy. And I don't think the U.S. should have a no first use policy. And I'm... I, I'm there are colleagues and friends of mine in the U.S. Who, who are very strong proponents of no first use. And it's not that I don't think normatively the U.S. shouldn't have it. It's just I think it's impossible for the U.S. to make it credible. Right. Because it's not that I don't think no first use is a, is a bad like strategic option. It's to make it credible, you have to do certain things with your posture that the U.S. cannot do. Right. And probably will never do. But right. India could and did. Right. A recessed posture like China's is actually a pretty credible no first use policy. If you don't have warheads made it to your missiles in peacetime. And it takes a while to generate the force. A no first use policy is somewhat credible, right? SSBN's kind of complicated a little bit, the submarine force. But India was in a position where its no first use policy was just about as credible as China's was until we started seeing uh, higher states of readiness for the force, this ambiguity on no first use. Uh, and a parallel with Pakistani rhetoric on sort of tactical nuclear weapons. I even detest right. that phrase, but sort of battlefield nukes yeah. and the idea that it can even be used in a battlefield, yeah. which, which is a new ball game altogether. And I think that's right. I think if you, you know, uh, I understand where the discomfort comes from, right? And, you know, so normatively I said, look, India is in a position where it can actually have a no first use. And I think it's stabilizing. If you could reassure Pakistan, Although I think this cat out of the bag. I don't think there's anything India can do to actually convince Pakistan that it has anything resembling a no first use policy. But if you could, it really generated crisis stability, right? Then right. India could actually get a conventional punch in and not have to worry about escalation. If, if Pakistan really believed that India would never go first. But now if India – if it worries that India could go first and it has all these incentives to generate its force, move right. it around – uh, and to go first itself. And so they're real crisis instabilities if you cut off you know, no first use at the knees. And so that's kind of the world we're in right now. Uh, and the joke is that nobody believes China's no first use policy and India doesn't believe its own no first use policy. <laughs> so you know, it's not that I you – know, I, I got criticized for saying no first use is a bad idea. I, I'm agnostic. I think there are ways to make no first use actually credible. And I think there are situations in which it can actually be made credible, but you, you know, it has to be the Chinese model to do that. And even then, look how hard it is for China to convince the U.S. that it has a no first use policy. You hit three gorges, damn, all of a sudden there's no first use policy, right? So uh, in the in the Indian case, though, now with all this ambiguity and then with the Raksha Mantri's statement this year in August, I, I just think the cat's out of the bag. And then the question is, what do you do? Right. Do you now articulate a new policy or do you sort of go with status quo, make more right. statements and sort of uh, – My suspicion is that they'll just let it be as it is and you know, in order to – you know, there are two worlds. One, the BJP could say, look, we, we want to own this and we're going to issue a revised doctrine and we're just going to make it transparent and, you know, everyone right. else be damned. Fine. I wouldn't be surprised if that's what happens. Maybe there's a national security strategy coming out that has some language on this. Uh, or they could say, we've done what we need to do. The doctrine is there. We're not going to officially revise it, but we've injected enough ambiguity and now it's essentially official. So why do anything else? Right. right. And both options are plausible. Um, so let's see what happens. But in practice, I think it's reasonable now to assume that Pakistan never really believed the no first use policy anyway. But now you had an official gutting of it. At, you know. So um, I want to end on one sort of note. There's this idea also in nuclear, when we think about nuclear weapons, that you know there are states like Pakistan or North Korea that are sort of irrational. You know, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're crazy. They can do anything. So that idea that somebody can be irrational or crazy, and I'm using air quotes that won't be <laughs> audible yeah. to our listeners. Uh, I mean, that uh, idea of uncertainty in how people will react is also part of this entire strategy. Right? Correct. I mean, it's the so madman strategy. The more we feed that strategy, the more 
yeah, sort I mean, of legs it I think there's two types of rationality. One is means end rationality and one is mm -hmm. ends rationality, right? So I think we may disagree – you know, with Pakistan uses terrorism as, as a state strategy. Right. As an end, that's that is crazy. But they are means and rational to support this end. They are optimizing their nuclear strategy. Similarly, right. North Korea has a stated end of reunifying the peninsula. That is on its face absurd and insane. But means end, they are you know maybe optimizing their nuclear so your strategy. ends might be absurd but the means might be rational Correct. towards that absurd and i end. think you know it when i look at the pakistani nuclear strategy and the north korea and kim jong un in, in a lot of ways are hyper rational at the means end level okay. very r ruthless in pursuing the optimal means to achieve whatever ends they have set and we may all disagree with their ends uh, although i think the north korean ends aren't as uh, expansive as their constitution Right. List is, is reunification. It's survival for me. I think the North Korean aim is actually much more limited. Survival and economic growth. I don't think they're actually as ends crazy as Pakistan. I don't think, you know. What do you think that the end for Pakistan is? Perpetuation of the military state of Pakistan? I think Pakistan? that's right. I think, you know, uh, Chris Fair's book, Fighting to the End, the thesis is probably spot on, right? I, I think that's a. It's hard to disagree with her evidence, and she knows Pakistan better than anybody. And it's after you read that book, you think it really is a fight to the end. It, this is about the military sustaining its position in the society. And so the in way that to sense, do that, it's sort of like North Korea and survival, but not of the entire but, and and not of a, a not of a personalist dictator, right? right? And a personalist dictator that wants to provide economic growth for the country. I think it's hard to know with North Korea. And, you know, I want to be clear, Kim Jong-un is a brutal dictator who killed his half-brother with VX. At a, so he's not shy of terrorism when it comes to his own family at a major <laughs> international airport with kids around. Uh, but in Pakistan, it's the military, and the military wants to preserve its position in society. And that means extracting rents from the society. That means elevating its position. And how do you do that? How do you justify extracting 50 percent of the bu budget, maybe? You know, yeah. you know that's you have to keep the, the threat of conflict with India salient. And how do you do that? You have periodic crises, right? And so in a lot of ways, uh, Balakot feeds right into the Pakistani narrative because it gives them a justification for their raison d'etre. India is an existential threat. And, you know, in some ways, restraint took away that narrative. But, you know, there's a tension. Restraint may be the long-term strategic, you know, the strategically optimal strategy for India, but it's so hard to sell domestically, right? It's so hard to say I'm going to accept a Bombay or a or a Pulwama and not do anything. Right. And uh, how many times will you not do anything? And how many times? Will you, yeah. And so this tension exists. But if you do something, you play right into the Pakistani hand too, right? And so this is the tension I think, you know, India has to has to navigate. And it's always an evolution, right? The one thing we know about the nuclear age, nuclear ages, however many we're at, is that they're living, breathing things and they're constantly evolving. And so there's no one optimal strategy. That strategy changes as your adversary reacts differently also. Dr. Narun, thank you so much for coming on the Prakriti Podcast. A, it was this a great was pleasure. A wonderful tour de force yeah. into the, the various madnesses that are underlying Indeed. nuclear strategy and power. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure catching you Likewise, here. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for staying with us till the end. If you have any questions or comments, do write in to podcast at thinkpragati.com. And hey, if you like the podcast and listen to us on iTunes or Apple Podcasts, please leave us a rating and a review. It'll mean a lot to us. The Pragati Podcast is available on the IVM Podcast app and pretty much every other podcast app and platform. We are there everywhere. Namaste, I am Saurabh Chandra. And I am Pranay Kutistani. जब महफिल खत्म होते होते दरवाजे के बाहर पुलिया के ऊपर हम दुनिया भर की जटिल समस्याओं को सॉल्व करने में लग जाते हैं तो हो जाती है पुलियाबाजी अब आजकल के अपार्टमेंट वालों ने तो कभी पुलिया देखी नहीं होगी पर आप फीलिंग तो समझ ही सकते हैं तो आइए शामिल हो जाइए हमारी पुलियाबाजी में जहां प्रणय और मैं एक से एक इंटरेस्टिंग टॉपिक्स की तह तक जाएंगे आर्टिफिशियल इंटेलिजेंस बिटकॉइन पाकिस्तान मेडिकल एजुकेशन करेंसी क्राइसिस कभी हम दोनों के साथ और अक्सर स्पेशल एक्सपर्ट गेस्ट की कंपनी में सुनिए हमें आईवीएम की वेबसाइट ऐप या अपने फेवरेट पॉडकास्टिंग प्लेटफार्म पर हर दूसरे हफ्ते How aware do you think you are of your laws and rights? Do you look up to laws when you are caught up in situations? Do you know what your rights are when you're stuck somewhere bad? 
Well, here's a show that can help you move an inch closer to being aware of what your rights are. Tune into Know Your Kanoon with me, Amar Rana. This is a podcast meant to answer all your law-related queries. Catch Know Your Kanoon every week on the IVM website or the app or anywhere you get your podcast from.